Welcome to this Arctic Art and Feminism session. My name is Mali and I'm the Diversity Manager of Wikimedia Norway. Art and Feminism is a global initiative working to reducing uh, information gaps on the internet concerning gender, feminism and art. Arctic Art and Feminism aims to work on the indigenous information gap online. With these sessions, uh, we want to give you a deeper understanding on what the indigenous information gap is and how we all can work to reduce it. This is a big question that requires long and in-depth answers. That's why today we're very grateful that Lisa Ravna Finnberg has taken her time to help us with this. Welcome Lisa Ravna. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you just uh, defended your PhD uh, as a museologist. Yeah. <laughs> and one of your biggest um, uh, takeaways, in uh, what I, my impression is, this uh, idea on the, that the indigenous cultures should own their own epistemology. Do you want to explain to us what you mean by that? Um, I think in general there is this... Um, a consequence of colonialism is that not only is country dispossessed from indigenous people, but their culture is dispossessed as well in some ways. Um, this sense of, uh, you know, when you hear people talking about our indigenous people or the indigenous people of Norway, of uh, the United States, of Japan, etc. What you see here is a very um, asymmetrical power relation where one culture um, has an advantage over another culture. And one of those advantages is the sense of ownership. So, you know, you take the ownership away from indigenous people. Um, and, and that's also something that you see reflected in, for instance, systems of knowledge or our epistemologies as opposed to the Western epistem epistemology. Um, so, how to put it in a good way? Um, It's, yeah, I, yeah, I think So that's when you did your dissertation, you built your work mainly on indigenous sources? Or well, no, actually, I, I, actually, I did uh, what every indigenous scholar is expected to do. I had to sort of build up competency within an indigenous field of reference, but I also had to do the same for Western uh, scholars like I had to really know better than my colleagues what was going on in the Western field of science because I needed to argue to argue that you know what we're doing here in an in indigenous context is not uh, is not wrong it's not lesser it's not about what's better or worse but you know because of the way the system is built so we like to call, you know, you can call it an epistemic ignorance. And what happens is that knowledge systems other than the Western knowledge systems are not only marginal, they are basically dismissed or like completely made invisible. Um, and so what happens when someone come in, comes in and want to build their work on the foundation of a system that is not Western, they not only need to like build up a structure centering it in an indigenous context, they also need to make uh, references to a Western context to sort of argue that this is valid. Um, so I would like to see us get past that stage. Um, I don't think we, we haven't reached it yet, but you know, there are a lot of us now working very hard to do that, to, to really center our own ontologies and epistemologies, our own ways of being, of knowing and doing, and using that as the foundation in everything that we do. And, and one of the things that you are talking about when you talk about the knowledge system of, especially the Sami people, is the Duoji and all the knowledge that is gathered in the Duoji. Yeah. Yeah, because again, and, and this is, you know, one of the things that happens during colonialism is that, um, the indigenous ways of knowing and doing and being are sort of alienated. So, um, and I'm not, not only are they alienated in a like very mainstream con context, they're also alienated in, a, in an indigenous context, right? So, Doitia, for instance, we can't really translate it. You can't translate it to any other language because 
that's just not possible. Dochi is a concept that is wholly Sami. And I mean, of course, you have various concepts in other indigenous cultures that perhaps have some, um, some similarities, but it's not the same, right? Um, and so what happened, you know, in this meeting between different epistemologies, uh, and Doji is an epistemology, it is a system of knowledge, but I'll get back to that. What happens in these different meetings is that those with power, so the Western side, de redefines Doji into craft. So it's basically, that's it. It's only craft. It's something you work with your hand. There is no knowledge in it. There is no, uh, you know, holistic perspectives in it. It's only craft. Um, and so when this is the definition that is pushed forward, uh, and is what is available out there, then that's what it becomes, you know? Mm -hmm. If you tell one story and only one story about something, then that becomes the truth. And so it's easy to say that the Sami didn't have, you know, the Sami was primitive, the laps, the laps, which we are sometimes referred to, which is a very racial uh, or racist derogatory term. But, you know, we didn't have systems of knowledge. We didn't have value in our cultures. And, you know, this is what we're attempting to do now. We're attempting to sort of argue or push back to counter the colonial narrative saying that, well, excuse me, yeah, we totally had, uh, we totally have our own systems. It's just about you not acknowledging them. And that's what you need to do. You need to understand that and, you know, if you're talking to a Western audience, you, you know, you really have to, you really have to state and push and argue them that you're not right. Your way is not the only way. And we need to really get that, you know, fully through. And so that's why it's so important that we raise these discussions, that we talk about these concepts and that we also not redefine them, but take back, we, we like, we reclaim the definition. And so that's what I've been attempting to do with Deutsche. And that's why I argue very strongly uh, in my dissertation and my work that we're talking about an epistemology. It is a system of learning. It is a way of knowing, of doing, and of being. And so, yeah. Yeah, because in your dissertation or in some of your presentations, you have defined um, Deutsche, the different aspects of Deutsche that is very special. You want to yeah. I mean, uh, so I was, <laughs> when I was working on my dissertation, you know, you have this structure. So you have to have the introduction, the analysis, you have to have the methodological part, and then you have to have the theory. And I was kind of stumped on the theory a bit. I was looking at like these really well-established Western theories that I found um, somehow felt familiar to me. And of course they felt familiar because this is what I was used to in a Sami context. But you know, the longer I worked with these Western um, theories, for instance, actor network theory, which is, you know, very, um, it's very important in the ANT that uh, relate, everything is relational, which is also really basically what the Sami society is all about, that everything is relational. But at some point I kind of had to stop and think and like, you know, we have this in a Sami culture. We have this way of thinking about things. So shouldn't I really use that as my framework? And that's what I did. So I tried to, I tried to like write about Deutsche as a theoretical framework for understanding. And that included, you know, uh, introducing to the audience uh, four different concepts. And I say introduce, they, these are established concepts. They're already, they've been around <laughs> in, in Satmi, but not necessarily to the same degree in a non-Sami context. So, and these, these kind of four uh, concepts were um, so Wekje is South Sami. In North Sami, you would say Wagas, which is basically aesthetics, like what is beautiful. So what is beautiful in a Sami um, way of thinking about aesthetics is not necessarily the same as what you would think of as beautiful in a non-Sami you know but there is this and if you look at art for instance as a concept art is a very colonial concept and art sort of sets this very narrow understanding of what what is beautiful what is aesthetics um, and when you work with Deutsche 
the way that you see aesthetics is very different because um, beauty is relational. So what is beautiful to you is often determined not only by outer appearance, but also how it relates to everything else. So how it relates to uh, other people, to family, to the world, to spirits and to materials, you know? Um, so that was one thing that, that I worked with. I also worked with um, the concept of like birrasat, which is surroundings. So because you're always shaped by what's around you, uh, and you know, in a in a practice of doji, that basically means that when you work, for instance, with tanning skin, the way that you tan and prepare the skin is shaped by the knowledge that you have developed um, through a constant dialogue with your surroundings. So, which you know, which bark, which tree has the bark that will give you the most beautiful color in in the tanning of the skin. Um, and you know, it's 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 kind of this is what is sort of reflected in everything that you know. And this is what I talked about. Like when when you talk about ANT as looking at the world as a relational, and then you had Doiti, where everything in Doiti is relational, and that applies to aesthetics. It applies to surroundings, and it also you know goes back to this idea of um, uh, Tida, which is spiritual. Um, like this, the spirituality of it. So, um, and I, you know, I really don't feel comfortable talking too much about that, of the spiritual aspect, because that, that I feel is very much something that belongs to us and it should remain with us. And if, you know, and I, as one person, can't really talk about it too much without having the approval of my community. So I, I mentioned a few TIDAs in my dissertation that has been approved by the people that I was working with, the other uh, Dwayrat. Uh, but so, and you know, the last concept that I worked with was Arbetiyatu. So often when you talk about the knowledge systems of indigenous people, you refer to it as traditional knowledge. And so Arbedietu has often been translated to be uh, traditional knowledge, but really Arbedietu means knowledge that is inherited. Uh, so it's knowledge that you gain from either, and you know, it's not only something that comes from, um, and it co comes to descendants, it can also be amongst peers. So, you know, it goes both ways, both up and, you know, sideways and up and down. Uh, but this concept, you know, is really what Doji is all about. It's a system of knowledge and it's a knowledge that is collective. It's a knowledge that um, has existed, you know, can we really put a timeline? I don't think we can, but this is, this is basically what Doji encompasses and so much more. This is just one small part of it, but yeah. Because you have been uh, talking about how Doji is your literature, how it is your legal papers, how it could be, uh, it's your storytelling. Yeah. And this goes back to, you know, again, when you look at the difference between, say, Western communities, society and indigenous communities. Because a lot of the time, what is thought of as literature is very basic something that is written down and printed or at least you know written down on paper um, this is literature as we know it but you can't really put that way of defining onto uh, a Sami society I mean yes of course we have literature um, that is defined as literature in a Western context but we also have our our literature and our literature is oral stories so it's you know, it's been, it's stories and, and anecdotes passed down through the generations, but it's also in our objects and things. So these becomes our repositories of knowledge. This means that, you know, when I put on the Gakti, for instance, uh, this is a document uh, detailing which rights I had to my Siva, to my home community. Now, prior to colonization, Sapmi was organized in the Siva structure. Um, and, it, you know, it's, 
it was it varied it was very multi-layered it varied greatly from place to place so it's not as if you can put down these bullet points and this is a cedar but basically a cedar is an uh, is an area um, and there is this certain you know there are certain families certain uh, clans that ha holds rights of use to that area be it like farming or fishing or hunting or yeah um, today, when we no longer live in the cedar structure, because the cedar structure has, you know, it was completely wrecked. Um, the only, you know, today a cedar is basically um, that belongs to the rain, you know, that's the yeah. reindeer, reindeer herding uh, or reindeer herding uh, villages. Um, but we still remember which areas the cedars, you know, which area, which sea, which cedar was in which area and the Gakti displays that knowledge so if you know the Gakti if you know the language of the Gakti and of Dwekti then you can look at someone and, and you can place them in a Sami society so so this is you know this is our knowledge this is our knowledge system um, and as it's not recognized as valid sources <laughs> When we sort of do our research and we argue, um, you know, we encounter colonial narratives based on our sources, it's so easily dismissed. It's like, no, well, you don't have literature going back that far. And I'm like, yes, we do. We just, you know, it's not a literature you would understand, but we understand it fine. Yeah. So, and that means that because we understand it, we should be allowed to interpret it and also put it into effect in a larger whole, meaning that, you know, our sources should be taken into account when we have judicial uh, processes in court arguing who has the right to which part of Norway or Sweden or Finland, you know, or Russia. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I that guess. was very political, yeah. but you know, <laughs> we can do political as well. Yeah. Uh, but of course, but we are mostly doing Wikipedia, which also is, um, I mean, it might sound small. Wikipedia is just like a little website, but then again, Wikipedia is where most people go to find information. Yeah. And on Wikipedia has become a big, um, I mean, the, the, the need to put documentation on everything you write has yeah. become very important. And at the same time, we know it's a gap on who contributes. Yeah. Um, and all indigenous cultures are struggling with this documentation part, and most of them with having an oral, uh, struct, uh, oral structure of their knowledge. So do you have any thoughts on how we can get to actually close this information gap uh, with uh, this knowledge? How can we as Westerners support you and how can the Sami community um, do it? To well, I think, you know, like that's one of the things that I've been doing with my dissertation is that I've created um, a source that people can now apply. I've argued things based on um, oral sources, on Dwechi, on, on Sami knowledge systems, and I put it down on paper, making it into literature. So while that is in itself you know then there is an adherence to this idea that literature is only the printed word but at least it's a place to start and hopefully with enough of these kind of kinds of works we'll get to a point where people start to acknowledge that you know the western way of doing things is not the only way and to be quite frankly it's not the best way at all and it's what like, would you say is the best way I would say the best way is to respect the difference, you know, that there are different, different uh, systems in place in different cultures and amongst different people. And I would also say that, um, you know, there is this thing about, so the system or the world we live in today is based on colonial structures. So the, the, the countries, the nations, the, the, the nation countries are basically built upon imperialism and upon colonialism and those are the structures in place and those structures no matter how much you argue or talk or you know uh, work against it they will always be colonial structures mm. you know you can't take the colonial structure and say no you know what we're gonna 
turn them way around and say that this is an indigenous structure. It's not going to happen. So uh, really what that means is that the solution can come from the Western society and from those structures. It needs to come from us. So we need power of definition. And that means power of definition when it comes to source, what's the source material that we can apply, for instance, on writing uh, on Wikipedia. Because Wikipedia has a lot of power. A lot of young people go there when they want a short and easy answer to a question. And what they read, they take as, you know, this is the truth. This is how it is. And if that truth is pushed only by white Europe on the basis of white Europe's sources, what does that mean? That's, you know, that's just continuing the colonialism. So in Sakmi, we have this thing where we say, or in, in, in the indigenous world in general, we, we say there is no post-colonial. As long as there are indigenous people, colonialism is a fact. And I'm not saying this to argue that we need to, you know, uh, redraw borders and establish, um, you know, nation, in, nation states for indigenous people. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is to acknowledge the state of the world and also acknowledge the history behind it. How did we get to this point? In 2017, when the then Prime Minister Jens Stoltenberg gave a speech at NATO, he said Norway has this proud history because we are one of the few countries in Europe that can claim to not have a colonial past. And by saying that, what he's doing is actually stepping on every Sami person yeah. and not to mention the, the slave trade that Norway was involved in. So you can't really whitewash history, uh, although I see it happen all the time. And I think establishing, you know, a broader specter of what source uh, a source really is, is one way to stop doing that. Yeah, I think, uh, and I'm uh, very happy you mentioned this because I think a lot of Norwegians struggle to um, accept that Norway. Yeah. Has that history? <laughs> well, I, one of the issues is that you know when you come into these discussions, and I often have people get really angry with me, uh, and I get like uh, personal messages on my social media platform wanting to argue with me and say that you, Norway isn't a colonial state, like Norway, Sweden, it's not colonialism. You you need to you can't use that word, and I and I'm like, well, look, I'm talking about these processes, and we call them colonialism. That's not me saying or accusing you of being colonial. You know, I'm not saying that you're a colonialist. What I am saying is that the system that we live in is colonial because of the colonial past of these nations. And those systems, they privilege you yeah. and your ways of being, knowing and doing on the, you know, and the cost comes from my people. It comes from indigenous people. We're paying for, for you know, white Europe uh, and these uh, white <laughs> in colonial nations to continue having privilege. The cost comes from us. Yeah. And that's not right. And if you can recognize that and say, you know what, you're absolutely right, then I don't think you're any better than a colonialist. No. I think you could basically just step into a time machine go back a couple of hundred years and just be as, you know, just live your comfortable life. Maybe it will suit you better because the time has come when we need to say the world is colonial exactly. in its essence. Yeah. And that's a problem. It's a problem for us, the indigenous peoples, because it, you know, colonialism survived by destroying our cultures and our knowledges. So and also, I think, you know, looking at the world today, all of the difficulties we have with, you know, the climate and the way things built, I think we can safely say that, you know, your way, the Western way hasn't really worked out too well. So maybe it's time to let us do things for a little while. And maybe, you know, I'm not saying we can fix it, but I'm saying that definitely we have better ways of organizing the society. I feel all my smiles are so misplaced, <laughs> but I'm just happy because I think it's so important to get this down. And especially what you said, it's not me, I'm not a colonist, but I belong to the country that has colonized your, the land yeah. of the Sakmi. And uh, by having these conversations, I hope we are able to 
lift up to this step where we go, where do we go next? How do yeah, we yeah, solve yeah. it? And as you mentioned, I mean, we were going to talk about art and logy, but it's also <laughs> the environment. Has well, a, it becomes it's, everything. Uh, it is everything, yeah. And, it's a, and you know, it's not as if, you know, I, I'm, I've reached an age where I can like, I can think, I can go like, so 25 years ago or 30 years ago when this and that, I remember. Um, but yeah, I remember like when I was a teen that people weren't talking about colonialism in a Sami context, you know, because we've been force fed this image of assimilation. Mm -hmm. Assimilation happened, that was it. But, you know, no, no that's not it. Assimilation or cultural genocide, as we call it in indigenous uh, lingo, um, happened as a direct result of colonialism. But colonialism didn't happen because of assimilation. So, you know, you need to get, you need to get history straight. You need to get the facts straight. And one way of doing that is looking to the sources that we have in our communities. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, as you also said, the young people, they go to Wikipedia, <laughs> that is where they find the truth mm -hmm. although we, everybody knows you cannot trust everything but it's still where you go to yeah. find a short summary of the truth yeah so how can uh, us that belong to the western culture contribute to getting the right information out there without stepping over mm. the l limits in well, a way but still supporting like you yeah. said earlier how can we decolonize Mm. while you indigenize our Wikipedia? Well, I think the first step is to really uh, familiarize yourself with, uh, with what sources are and how sources can be different things. And one way of doing that is actually reading up <laughs> because indigenous scholars have for decades now been putting out amazing work um, and it's all available, but you know, it's not read outside of our communities yeah. and that needs to change that needs to change but that also goes back back to academia and epistemic ignorance that we need to get academia to understand that sources from indigenous scholars are equally valid it's funny because after my dissertation after i submitted my dissertation and defended it um, you know one of the, like one of the things that i often heard from uh, people at the university were, I haven't really, you know, I, I haven't understood at all what you're doing. Now I get it. You know, yeah. now I understand. But before that, it was difficult to imagine what I was doing. Like, basically just this idea of me sitting at the office and doing my own geeky thing. But really what I was doing was trying to... I was actually going into a very white Western space and claiming space for indigeneity for my indigeneity um, and you know okay it's now they get what what that that was actually what I was doing and that's and you know small steps further. small steps yeah, small steps, steps. Uh, but things are continuously evolving and I think we're going in the right direction I just think that um, a lot of the time what needs to happen is that Western white Western um, society sort of uh, commits to listening and not just consulting like going in and okay I've listened to you now I'm still gonna do it my way but at least I've listened it's you know commit to listening and then act accordingly um, and I think I think basically that that should be something that is put into you know if you have stature that's where you put it if you have guidelines that's where you put it put it in writing put it down for the west you know put it down uh, in a way that western society will respect and acknowledge it like because i'm happy with when i'm happy with oral being the way this message is um sort of disseminated but in a western context if it's not writing then people won't respect it so put it in writing so would you say that all the new media that, that we are having now, Instagram and, and YouTube and all that, do you think that can be a very supportive for getting the knowledge about indigenous people? Well, out absolutely, there? because what you have to consider is that, um, like, where do our, where do our side gets, you know, where do we get to tell our side of the story? It's rarely in the national newspapers. 
you know, they'll support this established system. They'll rarely support the indigenous um, perspective. So where do we tell our stories? Where do we take ownership? We do it on social media, you know, and that's what you see a lot of people in my generation and, and younger generations. That's where they reclaim their indigeneity, where they reclaim the pride in their history and in their culture. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. That's good. Um, do you have an advice you want to give to um, younger people of Sahmi origin, how they can help? Because I, I imagine it's a lot of young people who want to support yeah, but they don't know really where to start. Where would you say? You know, we have a lot of organizations. For instance, you have youth organizations that are, you know, trans uh, trans Sami. Uh, you also have local organizations um, that you can, you know. I think what we really need to see happen is that young people have spaces where they can gather and safe spaces. So spaces where they can go and actually be Sami without feeling pressured or without feeling, um, you know, this need to, to sort of represent. That's what we need. And I think that needs to be in place before young people, you know, if you want to be comfortable enough to sort of go out on social media and argue your case, you need to be comfortable amongst your own. You need to be comfortable in yourself. And that's how we create that, I think. So safe spaces. Safe basically. spaces, yeah. A lot of safe spaces. A lot of safe spaces. A lot of more safe spaces than we currently have. And also, just... And this advice is more to non-Indigenous people. It's never assume that you know better. You know, never assume that you even if you're a professor of history, don't assume that you know better than a 16-year-old Sami person who has experienced racism and violence on their body. You know, yeah. I think that's important to have, to have this, to just be humble, yeah. like non-Sami people, be humble in your meeting with Sami. We have our, our history, we have our embodied knowledge and our embodied experiences and don't you know, don't dismiss them. Don't devalue them, yeah. I think. Yeah. Very good advice. <laughs> and I hope someone will follow. I hope everyone I really will hope. follow it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do you have anything more you want to add now to this? No. No? You're no. feeling good? No, I'm, you know, I'm feeling pretty good with what's been uh, said. Um, yeah. Okay, so as we have seen, um, Closing the indigenous information gap on Wikipedia is going to take some time and it's going to require a lot of effort both on my side and on your side, if we can put it that way. Um, and it's quite ironic that this being Arctic art and feminism, the very first thing we have done is to take the Dwoji, take the indigenous handcraft out of the arts and into the knowledge systems. Um, I hope you have learned something today. I hope you are feeling inspired to do your bit to change Wikipedia. Um, thank you so much, Lisa Rauna, for joining me. Um, thank you for following us. Bye.